I'm going to move on to our second scenario. And the question that we posed to our panelists beforehand was, how has your personal or your family's migration story influenced your life, your music making, your research, et cetera? And I think we're going to start with Lauren for this one. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's a great question. And I already mentioned in my introduction that I'm a fourth generation, you know, American on, on both sides, right? So my great grandparents um, on both my mother and my father's side were immigrants to the US. So, you know, my family on both sides has been in, been in the country for over 100 years. Uh, and yet the sense of having a migration story be a part of how I think of my place in the world and my relationship to my career is ab absolutely central. Um, I think that, you know, in particular, I was close to both of my grandparents, right? Both, uh, both sets of grandparents that I had were children of immigrants. Um, both were bilingual. So on my mom's side, my grandparents spoke Yiddish and English. Um, because that's the language they, they spoke, you know, grew up speaking Yiddish with, with their parents. And then on my father's side, my grandmother and grandfather, you know, spoke Japanese and, and English because their parents had come from, from Japan. And so that was something I was always aware of. I was close to my grandparents, um, got to know them, you know, uh, throughout my, my childhood and, and into college. Um, and I think I, I would say, um, in particular, my um, father's mother, my, my grandmother on that side, uh, the, ja the Japanese side, um, I ended up going over and helping her out with yard. I, I see now the theme emerging here is yard work, right? I used to go and help her after my grandfather had passed away, uh, who was a big gardener. You know, she was worried about the plants in the yard getting into disarray. And so I had a, when I was living in Los Angeles, I would go over to her house once a week and, and pull weeds and and then she'd cook lunch for me and would hang out. And this was sort of around the time that I was an undergraduate and started to get interested in, in majoring in ethnic studies, where I was taking classes on Asian American history and learning about uh, the experiences of, of my, you know, basically my ancestors on that side of the family. What, what were the forces that brought them to Hawaii? What were those experiences like? And I um, inter you know, started talking and asking my grandmother a bunch of questions. and ended up interviewing her. Um, and so what ended up, how I ended up getting into music professionally was that at the same time that I was uh, majoring in ethnic studies and helping my grandmother in her yard, I was also taking piano lessons with um, a local uh, Los Angeles based uh, pianist and composer, um, Glenn Horiuchi, who, um, you know, wrote, oh, made albums. You couldn't see the title here. This, the title of this album, Man's in Our Voices, right? A lot of his, um, a lot of his music dealt specifically with the Japanese American internment experience. And I happened to, I mean, it was almost pure coincidence that I ended up taking, taking music lessons with him, but I learned about him and other Asian American musicians who had been making music based on a lot of, that had political and historical themes based on their identity as Asian Americans. And so, um, I think that experience of being interested in my own family's migration story, um, learning about the history and politics uh, of Asian Americans in my schoolwork, and then taking you know piano lessons with this guy who happened to be a part of a community of, of mainly Chinese and Japanese Americans who had been you know recording and, and supporting one another in the sort of Asian American jazz and creative music scene since you know the 1980s and 1990s. Um, all sort of came together and I ended up doing a senior undergraduate research project um, on uh, that was a history of Glenn and other other musicians that he was associated with, um, mainly John Jang and, and Francis Wong up in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, others, uh, Mark, I, Mark Izu um, and, and, and Anthony Brown, um, other folks who really um, I got in touch with and invited me into sort of their lives and, and their musical worlds. and. Um, all those things came together, and that's how I ended up wanting to go to graduate school to study, to study, to become a musicologist. Yes, funny that me and Lauren are next to each other because our stories are adjacent in so many ways. Um, but my, uh, you know, my my music at its very the very core of its DNA is 
very much determined almost by migration stories in a sense. The like if, if there was to be like a thesis question of sorts for the music from the beginning, it's it's been that um, is there a possibility to find some kind of form in which the sounds I've inherited and grown up with, the traditions I've been a part of and studied, um, is there a way to find a form in which all of these sounds belong that otherwise feel very divergent and very unrelated? Um, that question, in a sense, is very much the question that, it's an echo of the question that took me to do my very first research in India and Pakistan as well, which was a question of why did these people who really felt like they belonged to a very specific city and a very specific um, society in the city of Lucknow, North India, which was always known for its communal harmony between Hindus and Muslims. What drove these people to decide that they no longer belonged and then belonged in a place like Pakistan? And then what drove them in Pakistan to determine that they no longer belonged to this place that they had really helped envision in, in this sense in 1947 and then brought them to the US. So in the process of like working for the archive and um, you know, collecting stories from both elders in my family as well as elders who I found just on both sides of the border. Um, hearing them, hearing their stories, hearing the sounds of the places that they were in, coming back to New York, coming back to Atlanta, thinking about the post-punk bands I had played in, the hip hop I had grown up with in Georgia. Um, it, all those stories, which in a sense were all echoes of one another, um, whether it was partitioned from India to Pakistan, whether it was from Pakistan to the US, even if it was down to like my parents coming from New York to Atlanta. Um, though that swirl has always kind of been at the back burner of why I'm looking to make certain sounds in a certain way. I think we're gonna pass. I'm not sure who's next. <laughs> Can you all hear me? Okay. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. So um, I grew up uh, in Southern Vermont and as such, I, I was pretty isolated as far as um, Asian American culture. I had uh, my grandparents, my aunts, uncles uh, on, my, on my Japanese father's side, they all lived on, around the Seattle area and in Los Angeles. Um, and my contact with them was maybe, you know, a care package from my old Jichan every Christmas that was full of senbei rice crackers. And um, so it, I, I feel like I spent a good portion of my time growing up trying to divorce myself from uh, my sort of Japanese American culture uh, just trying to fit in because frankly we were the only Asian family in the in the town that we lived in um, and it really wasn't until uh, I was an adult and uh, my daughter was born uh, who's now 13 uh, when you have a when you have kids suddenly your extended family becomes very very much more a part of your life and so we found ourselves going uh, to the West Coast quite a bit to visit relatives and um, introduce her to her cousins, her, uh, my cousins, her aunts and uncles. And she became very curious about um, uh, the cultural parts of being a Japanese American and asking us, you know, why, why don't we speak Japanese? Why, uh, why don't we have, uh, ramen for dinner <laughs> or um uh you know the the uh delicious senbei and rice crackers uh for, for treats and i i brought this up with my aunt uh, midori who is um she's a uh, uh a sume artist uh brushwork artist and she also is actually a musician she plays um koto and shamisen which are traditional japanese plucked instruments and uh, I talked to her about, you know, you know, 
my daughter's asking us, why don't we speak in Japanese? She said, well, knowing that I was a woodwind player, why don't, instead of learning how to speak Japanese, which is very difficult if you're not immersed in it, uh, why don't you learn how to play the shakuhachi uh, and uh, sort of learn about the music, learn, learn about Japan through music that way. And uh, so I, so I did, <laughs> and it really, uh, it really opened up this this whole nother musical language for me. And I started writing uh, music for my regular ensemble that would try to not necessarily incorporate um, the specific scales and rhythms of um, Japanese music, but more sort of in a, in a inspired way. Um, to look at the music. And uh, a few years ago, uh, my Aunt Maduri, again, um, translated a text that my, uh, my, my grandfather had written about his journey to uh, the US from Japan. And this was in 1911. So he was, he was the ripe old age of 13 when he came over by himself. And uh, like a lot of uh, immigrants during that time, uh, this was the yobiyose or the calling over of, of relatives to work, usually as a laborer and um, in his case as a, as a farm laborer on a farm in Tacoma, Washington, and then send the money back home. And it was uh, probably the most detailed account I'd ever heard of, of my family's immigration in the country. And that time was, it, between 1911 and then, you know, of course, World War II, uh, he ran into so many different um, situations, uh, being Japanese American and not, first of all, not speaking the language. He had to go through fourth grade as an adult, uh, learning English. And, and so there were so many stories that uh, I was able to write and uh, read about and sort of translate into music. And I, I came up with this idea to write a suite based on um, uh, his voyage to uh, the US and um, some of my other relatives uh, who were, came over later and some who were actually already over here and uh, many of whom were sent away to internment camps, uh, Manzanar being one of them um, uh, during the, World War II years. And uh, I pitched that to Chamber Music America and they gave me a nice big grant uh, to write for my ensemble. And uh, we premiered it in December. And so we're gonna, as I said, we're gonna record in August. August. Uh, but I did incorporate a lot of um, uh, imagery from that story, uh, temple bells, um, Japanese work songs, some of the rhythms uh, using taiko drums. Uh, so it's been a, it's, had a, a big influence, I think, in my adult life. Um, uh, there are so many reasons why uh, that wasn't the case, I suppose, when I was, when I was a child, but um, uh, I'm really grateful that my, my daughter was able to sort of provide a window into that part of my, my uh, heritage. Um, so my dad has always loved music and, um, and classical music and he had al always wanted to play violin. Um, but growing up in communist China, um, he was the ninth kid out of nine kids. And, um, I think they used to be a pretty wealthy family, but, um, I mean, they lost it all. Um, and so they were very poor and um, they didn't have very much. And, um, but he really, really wanted to play the violin. So when he was a teenager, he told me that he sold three pairs of his pants um, to get money to buy his first violin. Um, so that's what he did. And, um, and then his older sister who, um, well, she's retired now, but she was a piano teacher. I guess by that time she was already living in Hong Kong and she was um, teaching 
piano in Hong Kong. So she would send him money every month so that he could take violin lessons. Um, so he started violin when he was older, maybe like 14 or 15. So um, he, he's kind of like an amateur violinist. Um, and, but he's always really, really loved it. Um, and then when he and my mom got married, they immigrated to America and, you know, they only had a few hundred dollars in their pockets and they just did whatever they had to do, um, to survive. So my mom, I think was a housekeeper at a, a hotel at first. And then my dad, uh, worked as a cook at um, like a teeny tiny um, fast food Chinese restaurant. It was called, well, it's called Walk Express. <laughs> and um, a few years later, my parents bought it. So, um, and they still run it today. Um, and they're, you know, open seven days a week. And, you know, they have 12 to 14 hour days. And um, it's just the two of them working there now. Um, but he, you know, he still kept his violin and I don't think he played it very much. But then when I came along and um, I saw my cousins, my mom took me back to China when I was like three. Um, so like I could meet my grandma and my, my cousins and stuff. Actually, she took me to Hong Kong because they were, they were in Hong Kong by that time. And, um, and I saw my cousins playing violin and I said, I wanted to play the violin. And um, when my dad heard that, you know, he jumped on that opportunity <laughs> to get me to play the violin. So he bought my, me a violin and he was actually my first violin teacher. Um, but I mean, it didn't go very well <laughs> because um, I, my, my dad's not the most patient person. And then also he would teach me when he got home from work. So it would be like, I would have like a 10 p.m. violin lesson <laughs> and I was like five and, you know, I didn't want to practice. I didn't, you know, I mean, I was a five-year-old. Um, so I think, you know, off and on violin lessons for two years, they finally got me like a violin teacher. Um, and, and that went a lot better. And I think I really fell in love with music and violin like when I was, you know, in middle school and high school, and um, I was playing in full orchestras, and I really fell in love with, you know, being a part of orchestra. Um, and I had, you know, really good orchestra teachers who, was, who inspired me to become an orchestra teacher. Um, and so when it was time for me to go to college, I really didn't know um, what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to do music. Um, and I mean, my parents weren't thrilled about me doing music. You know, they wanted me to be a doctor or lawyer, like all Asian parents want their kids to be. Um, but, you know, I think they just, they didn't want me to go into music because it, it's a hard life, um, especially if you want to do something like performance. And I think that was kind of what I was looking at. Um, but then I realized, like, I'm not going to make it as a performance major. <laughs> So um, I, uh, I went into music education and, um, and they were, they were fine about it. Like they weren't thrilled, but they were, they were fine because, you know, I can become a teacher and have a job and um, I won't be starving on the street. <laughs> and um, so like later down the road, after I had graduated, after I had become a teacher, um, you know, my dad said, you know, if he, if he had a choice in what he got to do with his life, he, he probably would have done something in music, maybe become a music teacher or something like that. So, um, you know, I think, I feel like I'm, I'm honoring him and he's kind of living his dream through me, um, which is great. Um, and, you know, I try to, I try to make them proud. That's great. Um